many other ways to talk about this, but I want to back up a bit to your personal motivation and want to set the scene. At the time that you were running for the Seattle City Council, we don't think in these terms today, but there was a woman's seat on the council and it was held by Myrtle Edwards, who, for whom the park along the waterfront is now named. And so if you were a woman, you were supposed to run for the woman's seat, never consider one of the other seats, but you bucked that trend. What were the thoughts going through your mind, Phyllis? I thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> the, the men would say, oh, oh, some people said to me, well, Phyllis, just cool it. <laughs> All right, if you just slow down a little bit, that seat is going to be yours anyway. So why sweat? And I just looked at him and, in awe that anyone could think like that. <laughs> so we just both beat ahead and, you know, it was, it was a wonderful campaign and very successful. Um, back to the open government thing, there's one vivid story I think you could tell. There's some water here for you, too, by the way. Um, the, the days before you led the reform of the structure of city government, you were actually in a budget meeting and Ted Best turned around and said, go ahead, finish the story here. Every, you were all sitting in the room, city council members, and there was some extra money left over. Oh, oh. <laughs> this was our first budget meeting after we were elected. Tim Hill, Sam Smith, and I were elected in November of 1967. So we were the first new blood on the council. And we were, we were inducted in January, but we had to have a budget for that year. We were turning over to a fiscal year in part of the reform. And so there was a hurried uh, budget meeting call. The, the council at that point had the budget responsibility. This was the major reform that we led in changing the government because the budget by state law had been vested in the city council. So who ran the city? City council. So we got to this uh, budget meeting, which was held by Ted Best. From West and, Seattle. From West <laughs> Seattle. And we met in the back conference room, not in the council chambers in the back conference room. This was the smoke-filled back room. Right. <laughs> and the finance uh, uh, person, staff person, came in and said, we have, I'm happy to announce that we have X amount of money surplus. And so Ted looked at me. I was sitting on his right, and he turned to me, and he said, Phyllis, what would you like? And I was aghast. And I'd just been made planning chairman, so I blurted out four planners. And he banged the gavel. He said, okay. He went to the next one, which was Tim Hill. And Tim Hill wanted a detox center. You know, we thought of these ridiculous things because this, this took us by such surprise got to Sam and Sam wanted a youth patrol and we went around the nine people, distributed the excess money, slammed the gavel, and the budget was adopted. <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> In a back room, granted at the council meeting the next Monday, we formally passed it. But that's the last time <laughs> Anything like that ever happened. We were so committed to open government. Everything was open. Everyone had a chance to speak. Uh, it was a amazing time. Well, we have you to thank for leading that uh, to get us to the point where you can testify at a public hearing on just about anything. Yeah. And you've probably heard that in Seattle you can't get anything done because there's an endless process, but I, 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 I imagine you beg to differ with that assessment. Well, it is quite a process. 
And, it's get, and it gets more complicated all the time because life does. And because the uh, burden on the city is tremendous. And you've just gone through an election and you've heard all about it. Uh, so you know it's, it's complicated, not only to run the city, but to be part of the region, to be part of the county, to be part of all the special entities that have been established to do with things like air pollution control and criminal justice and all that. Um, but somehow we managed to put one step in front of the other. There's always room for improvement, always room for more good minds like you all have that you can contribute to the solution. And that is the Seattle way now, right? Now we talked a little about open government. I'd like to talk about, you to talk about another topic with the word open in it that is near and dear to the hearts of many in here, Irma Cowden here in the front row in particular, and that is open housing. People, young people today don't even understand this era in the 1960s. Can you describe the atmosphere and what you had to go through in order to get what should be common sense, an open housing ordinance. It was unbelievable, the unrest uh, in the 60s, uh, stemming from everything from the Vietnam War to um, redlining in the central area. And can you describe redlining? Yeah. So what it says, so realtors would draw a red line about around the neighborhoods into which you do, did not put any money. And so the citizens, and I will say in that connection, I was living in West Seattle, and West Seattle was lily white. I'm not proud of that. Uh, I had nothing to do with it, but I can remember when the first minority, which was a Japanese woman, moved into West Seattle, I thought they were going to darn feather her. So discrimination took place not just in the central area, but in other ways, in other communities. And uh, so, but anyway, redlining became a very volatile issue. And, uh, Safety in, the, safety in the streets and came along right with it. There were a lot of demonstrations, as you all know. Uh, we had helicopters. We had a time when helicopters flew over the central area in patrol until we forced them down. But the citizens brought petitions to the council to stop this red line. The council was still predominantly uh, old form. And, and so there were five pretty conservative people who had served over the years and were just serving out. It's like the end of any era. You have the hangers on and then you have the people who are trying to move the needle. So we're having a very bad time trying to get any consideration for the open, open housing ordinance that we drafted. But we kept af after it. We kept going out into the community and talking to them about the problem, matching uh, statistics and strengthening our case. And so we finally said, well, we gotta, we gotta just plunge. And we introduced it and we had the most vicious discussion among the council. And we finally, finally, Floyd Miller, bless his heart, broke ranks and joined us. And you could have felt the heat in the room. And one of the old council members stopped out and said, this is the darkest day Seattle will ever see. So there was a lot of tension. Uh, I never had any fear or any problem going anywhere in the city at that time. I just, uh, 
I guess I was just showed enough guts that they wouldn't dare do anything to me. But I can remember one fellow in the Garfield rally saying to me, what right do you have standing up there talking to us like this, you blonde hair, blue-eyed woman? So, the lot's changed. And any of you who were here, or any other community, urban community during that time, I'm sure went through the same experience. Again, we have a lot to thank you for. Um, You, you use the word demonstration. There's a, there's a more lighthearted demonstration story I'd like you to tell, and it had to do with uh, uh, West Seattle and the Highland Park neighborhood in West Seattle, down in sort of the southeast part of the peninsula that gets, tends to get forgotten about a bit. Uh, tell us about this. I um, was watching the counts. This was before I went on the counts, but I was watching them like a hawk. <laughs> and I was very familiar with their shenanigans. And I heard about the, a proposal to sell off a strip of Highland Park in West Seattle for housing development. This was public land that they were Public using. land, yeah. And I was outraged, especially when I heard that the proceeds were going to use to finish the international fountain that needed 16 more nozzles on it. <laughs> and, and that a familiar figure was going to get the contract to build that housing. So that was all I needed. But time was short. And so I gathered some of my friends and we with station wagons and we went to our school and a couple of other schools in West Seattle. At the end of the day, piled our kids in the station wagon. We made homemade signs the night before and we dumped the kids out on the sidewalk with these signs saying, don't sell the gateway to our park. I had notified the press, the press was all there. <laughs> it never would have happened today, but <laughs> everything was just, the women just did things, you know, automatically and spontaneously, and what do you do? You march and you hold your kids, give them all banners, and you shout your piece. So we stopped that one. But the interesting part was that my husband later was on the uh, Civic Center Commission trying to finish this international fountain. And he had to come and try to, to persuade me <laughs> to, to vote the other way. I said, tell us look. <laughs> well, you know, uh, West Seattle is in your bones just like it is in mine. In fact, uh, we've been We've been practically neighbors. Um, I live in the North Admiral District of West Seattle, and you lived there for for uh, 39 years, I think, from 1953 to 1992. And I want to get to the topic of the West Seattle Bridge, but first, just <laughs> talk about why West Seattle for you? What drew you there? What's unique about West Seattle? When I was growing up, West Seattle was the other side of the tracks. I wouldn't, I only went there, I was so inclined, I only went there to go to the natatorium before it burned down. And then after that, there wasn't any reason to go there. But uh, my sister came back to, she also went to New York, but she came back to Seattle before I did with a young family. And the only place she and her husband could find to buy a house they could afford was in West Seattle. So she settled in West Seattle, and I, like a dutiful baby sister, followed her eventually, because I realized what an amazing place it is. It was, was and is still something like a small town. It's not so small anymore. But it is cohesive, 
and it's full of loyal people. They're getting uh, more democratic all the time, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, so we had an opportunity to locate there, which I won't be forever grateful for because we wound moving from one place to another, wound up with an absolutely gorgeous spot in a house designed by Ralph Anderson on the bluff overlooking the city with a 180 degree view Unbelievable and no obstruction. Too. Unbelievable, seven floors. Seven floors in that building. It's as if it were pasted on the hill. <laughs> what was the headline in the paper? It was... The house that variances built. <laughs> <laughs> Experiences built, and I was planning chairman at the time. <laughs> so you can imagine how that went over. <laughs> but it was all a joke. <laughs> well, often when people think about the West Seattle area, they think about the West Seattle Bridge, and you had more than a little to do with that. In fact, in the history book that we put together back in 1987. I made sure we had a photo of Phyllis in a, in a rowboat out in the water, out in Elliott Bay, promoting a vote on the West Seattle Bridge. And what I'm really intrigued for you to tell this group, we all know, most of us have been over the West Seattle Bridge a few times, but it's not the bridge that you envisioned. And can you tell us a little about what we might have had, had your vision become reality? Well, as is unfortunately the case. The jurisdiction puts together a, a capital improvement program, and the West Seattle Bridge was in Seattle's capital improvement program with an insufficient amount of money. So we went through the design, and a design of a cable stay bridge was the winner, and it was a gorgeous bridge, but the bid, we had $37 million and the bids came in at 51. <laughs> and so the city caved and 20 or some years later, finally got a high level bridge with $80 million, I think, from the feds. But I think about that often because, and there was a scandal attached which in which I was in, enmeshed but exonerated uh, because I worked so closely with the chief engineer to try to get this thing. I had taken all of our, our elected officials, including Scoop, uh, up the Duwamish on a freighter to show them how pinched the waterway was, how it had to be improved if we were going to expand the port up the river. Um, and so I was really committed to that bridge. The, unfortunately, the contractor had some connection with someone in the city, not me. And so that, was, that design was discredited and we subsequently built another one. But, the spirit in West Seattle, the number of parades, the number of demonstrations, the number of picnics, the number of, of activities that we organized and experienced and put forth about that bridge was interminable. But the, the West Seattle folks are hard-hearted people, and by God, they were going to get that bridge and now, eventually did. I'm going to surprise you with a question. Um, it's intriguing to me, uh, this West Seattle bridge situation. West Seattle was so pent up and furious that they weren't going to get a bridge that there was a petition campaign to secede from the rest of the city. <laughs> and it was only when uh, the Chavez hit, well, they called it the night the ship hit the span, yeah. Uh, the Chavez in 1978, that pride loose the federal and other governmental funding, and that got the ball rolling. But there was a petition there, Phyllis. Did you sign that petition? I don't 
things. <laughs> uh, but I do remember the night the Chavez hit, uh, the city engineer, Paul Moriaki, or something, called me and said, Phyllis, were you on that the bridge with the captain that night? Because he always accused me and I threatened to distract the captain at just the time when <laughs> we were in the tightest part of the channel so that we could just give that those stanchions a little nudge and they'd fall down. So he was absolutely certain that I had planned the whole thing. <laughs> Well, bringing us up a little closer to the present time, we have some things to thank you for in the city uh, that, that we see and use every day. And in the, uh, say, 10 minutes we have left, um, could you talk a little bit about the Convention Center and about South Lake Union Park? Both of those you were deeply involved in, and I believe are, are, are unsung in those roles, and I'd like you to sing a little. Yeah. Oh, you'd regret that. <laughs> uh, the convention, I was appointed as one of nine people to the first convention center board appointed by the governor. I was subsequently reappointed by three subsequent uh, governors. So I served 20 and a half years. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had because it's wonderful to be in at the very beginning of a project and see it all the way through. And it took 20 and a half years to do that. So I was, we were uh, assigned to site, build, and operate that facility. And that's what we did. I was on the design team, design committee for the board, and I was also the chair of the art committee. And I'm both proud of the building and the fact that we cited it where we did against lots of opposition because it is, was nestled down in the cityscape so it isn't a behemoth like most convention centers are in their very cities. They are not things of beauty, and I think this one nestled nicely. We did a lot of research. I went to a lot of convention centers, both in the U.S. and abroad, and I think that um, we took it in steps. We, uh, we dedicated the first building in May of 88. And we subsequently, and along with that, we also negotiated the transfer of the Eagles Auditorium to Act Theater. We also caused to have built uh, over 100, after that it was 200, uh, affordable housing units to make up for any of the structures that we had to take down. And we subsequently then expanded across Pike Street uh, and a mixed use uh, development there that encompasses that whole block. All we wanted was the top level so we could expand the exhibit halls and link them together, but the rest of it is used for other purposes. And now the convention has the Convention Center has become a public facilities authority, as the ballparks are, and so it's an independent entity uh, on its own, bringing in a huge amount of res res resources to the state. Huge success. It is planning on expanding again. Uh, in the property above the the uh, bus barn, in the air rights above the bus barn. I think they have purchased that. So that may be the next expansion. But it is a very successful facility that our collection 
is the largest by far of any convention center, and it's probably, probably and I think it's the only one that's open to the public. Most convention centers are pretty tight little islands, but this has a public purpose. Can, oh, can you uh, fairly park. quickly cover South Lake Union Park and the new Mohai Museum of yeah. History and yeah. Industry as well? Those also were projects that, that I was in on from the very beginning. Um, I was appointed to the, to, to the Seattle Parks Foundation, and our charge was to, to bring park experiences to the public that were compatible with and not competitive with the regular work of the Seattle Parks Department. So we decided that uh, there are some parts of the Olmstead plan that was, goes back to 1903, the layout by the Olmstead brothers of what the park system for this city should be. That was there and it was not complete. There's, and one of the places that had been designated was the South Lake Union area. So we were on the, I was on the search committee. We looked at the options available in the city and we decided that we should try to make a, to work for a, a significant park that would be compatible with that original homestead plan. So we chose that South Lake Union area, which was much neglected at the time. If you remember when the old, you know, junkyards were down there and the dumping and so on. Um, and so I became chair of the uh, planning committee for that in the steering committee, developing with the Hargraves design team the layout of the park, which went through a lot of configurations because everybody wanted to be part of that. Um, and uh, we dedicated it in August, I think, of 2010. And it's, and hand in hand with it, I'll just quickly do this. All the work we were doing on the park was, was confronted with the question, well, what are you gonna do with that old building there? Which was the armor building, which is, was there standing empty, just about and it is in the park land. So we didn't have the money to take that one on. But by that time, I was a member of the Mohai board, and Mohai was considering, had bought the property downtown because the old Mohai Museum was going to go away to be taken over by the State De Highway Department, Transportation Department as a staging area for 520. So we were gonna lose the museum land. We were told that, so we had to move the museum. And we were planning on moving it downtown, and I just couldn't, couldn't reconcile myself to that. Because there was a beautiful building on the water, down in the park, and what sense did that make? So, we put our little cabal together and it started researching the feasibility of abandoning the downtown site and moving into that armory. The armory is on the national and the state register, so you just can't willy-nilly do whatever you want with it. But the building is sound as a fortress. It is incredibly strong and incredibly beautiful, but it was neglected. And so we had to figure out how much it would cost, how difficult it would be, because you can't change windows, you can't do anything, you know, uh, without approval if you're trying to work with an historic building. Make a long story short, it is absolutely wonderful. For those of you who have gone, and the thing that 
that delights me so, and the thing that hooked me in the first place, is the floor. It's a drill floor, and it is two by fours on end, and they're built that way so that the drill master can hear every footfall <laughs> during a drill, and he knows who's out of step. <laughs> so when you go there, you be sure and look at that floor. It is absolutely gorgeous. I didn't know that. I'm going to have to do that next time. I've been to Mohai. We, my wife and I went the, the opening day, and uh, five hours later, we, uh, we left. I mean, you, you, you get hooked into that place. It's wonderful. We've got time for one sort of wrap-up topic, and, and there are so many other things we could talk about. I mean, the convention center is huge, and then there are these smaller things that have impact on us, like traffic circles. We have you to thank for them, too. <laughs> and you had to fight the fire department, right? Yeah, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Who swore at me every time he ran into one of those. <laughs> That was a new planning technique yes. for the time. And I got three of them approved, and the fire department did fight me all the way because it was going to interfere with their access to a burning building somewhere. But it, they're like Topsy, they've grown up everywhere and have proved to be a, a help in cutting down on traffic through neighborhoods. So let's wrap up here with some little philosophy, okay? I mean, this goes full circle back to the title of your book, which is The Life of a City Girl. And I want you to talk for just a few minutes about what makes a city and what is the morality involved in living in a city and making it better. Why is a city a great place to live? Why? You know, and this is obviously a, a retort to the people who say, I want to get out of the city. I yeah. want to I wanna <laughs> go out by myself. I want to get away from people. Talk about why you're a city girl. Because a city is so vibrant. If you want, if you want action, if you want excitement, if you want stimulation, if you want uh, fulfillment, whatever you want, you can find it in a city. And people rubbing together just cause a lot of energy to be circulating. We all feel that. When you get in a crowd and, and you have a response, you just don't go to sleep. Uh, and there are opportunities in, in cities of all kinds. Uh, and it's, it's electric. It's, and I've not been, as Clay said, I was president of National League of Cities, so we've gone to an awful lot of cities. And I feel that buzz no matter what the city. And that's kind of remarkable because uh, people say, oh, you know, well, that's just a small town. I can find excitement in a small town. <laughs> just find me a good bakery and, you know, I get all excited. <laughs> and most of the good bakeries are in the small towns. So uh, that's what I love. Well, can you believe how fast this hour has gone? <laughs> we could talk for another hour or two. I really appreciate you doing this, Phyllis. And which, you know, the old show business thing is you leave, leave them wanting more. And uh, maybe we can do this again sometime. One thing that I would like to do is to encourage others of you in this room to be willing to be victims of this same interview process. <laughs> and uh, everybody has a life story that is interesting. And uh, I certainly find um, interest in, in the little things as well as the big things. And we all have an impact on our life here. And the last thing I want to do is to just ask you to give a loud, long, ringing applause to Phyllis Lamphere for being part of this today. <laughs> And I'm just going to let you know before you leave, I've brought a brand new item here and some of them have already sold. And 
If you're interested in tote bags for the holiday season, we just have a 1928 billboard effort to try to get the homestead back up again. If you have been over there, you've seen it look, it looks like a ghost house. It, it's been nearly five years since the fire that, uh, that, that took place in, through, up through the roof, and it has not been restored. But we are teaming with Four Culture, with the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, and with Historic Seattle. We are not going to let that building go down. It is a city landmark, and we are working with the owner, and we don't care if it's the current owner or somebody who buys it, we are going to make sure that it will be restored someday. So I don't have any specific news to impart, but rest assured that behind the scenes, we are on the case. Thank you all for coming.